Okay, we are live. So great. Welcome to Tamara's Closet today. <laughs> Welcome to Tamara's Closet today. We've had some little technical difficulties getting on today, but we're here, so I'm excited. And I'm really excited because I have a special guest joining me today from Nashville. And he is a music producer, writer, programmer, and videographer and owner of OMG Nashville. He has produced over 200 recording projects and he's toured the world with a major recording artist for the last 32 years as a music director and keyboard player. He got his bachelor's in music from Michigan State, and for the past 18 years, he's been the music director, keyboard player, and co-producer for Lori Morgan, and together they wrote and co-produced the Walk Alone album. So I want to go ahead and bring him out since we've had some little difficulties, and uh, so I want to give a warm welcome to Mark. I hope I say your name right, Oliverius. Is that right, Mark? Perfecto. <laughs> okay. So now that I know he's he's still with me, we're going to go right into the questions. I really am excited to have you here. I've heard so many good things about you, Mark. So this is this is really a great treat for me. Um, I've never been to Nashville. I actually went to Nashville about three, maybe four or five years ago, but it was just for a seminar, so I never saw Nashville, so I don't really know much about it, but I like to start with a little family background, uh, just so sort for different reasons to show that people, sometimes we don't always have parents that do what we're doing, and sometimes we do, so I just kind of wanted you to tell me a little bit about, were there other artists in your family, like parents, siblings, in, any, in, your, in your family background? Brown. Well, Tamara, th first of all, thank you for having me. It's a it's a pleasure to be on with you, and and you do terrific work. And gosh, you're artistic. Your photos, you're creative. What a good creative you are! Awesome. Oh, okay. thank you. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up. In, short story: I was adopted at three days old. So my mom and my adoptive. Uh, my both loved music, and my dad was a was a a good violin player, and he played some harmo great harmonica. And we had an old player piano down in the basement, and I just started. Dad had new two songs on the player piano, so I just started pl plunking around at three years old. Um, wow! You know, and I just. You know, I, I took piano lessons and I quit and I took and I quit and I took and I quit. And it was one of those deals until I started a, my first band in in, uh, in middle school. And so I figured that that just gave me, you know, uh, once I once I started learning Lean on Me by Bill Withers, it was like I was all in. But my my come to find out years later, I found my natural father and mother and and my natural father's family is very they're very accomplished uh, musicians uh they they worked with uh the likes of duke ellington and they were actually musicians in the court of the some in in the, some of the kings of italy but you know uh that was but i don't know if it's genetic or not all i know is my my dad who was my adopted father uh -huh. he, he loved music and there was always music on in the house and I just fell in love. I saw the Beatles on TV and it just even drove me more, you know, so. Yeah. So were, did, did they listen to all different types of genres of music or? You know, they did, but they, we had a stack of 45s, uh, you know, RPMs that I played and they played all the time. But my dad really, he was, he loved polkas. I listened to so many polkas in the house. They love <laughs> polkas. Maybe it's cause you could have a couple of beers and get dancing and everything got cranked <laughs> up, you know, I guess. But uh, So no, it wasn't, you know, it, it was, it was a standard AM radio was always on. There was always music playing on that. So I used to just sit in my room as a kid and uh, turn the lights off and listen to the AM radio, you know? Wow, that's pretty That's pretty amazing. I think the first exposure I had to music was my mother had these 45s of 
Uh, what was the guy that sang Great Balls of Fire? What was Jerry that? Lee. Jerry Lee. Lewis. Yeah, Jerry Lee. Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe that's how I turned out to be a rock and roll girl. But I like, I like all genres. So, you know, I really do. But, so you were just exposed to a lot of different types. Um, do you, you were three, though, when you started with the playing around on the piano, you said? Right, right. Yeah, correct. That, that's just amazing. And because it, I also noticed in your bio, I thought it was interesting because when you were in college, you were doing, I thought this was interesting. You were doing jazz and like rock and roll. Yeah, I, I college was a wonderful, it was wonderful for me, even though I never did use my education degree technically as, you know, when it, when it came to work, I always was, I've always just, I left and I moved to Nashville after a few years of kicking around East Lansing after college. Um, but through college, I was a split tuba. I wanted to be a tuba player for the New York uh, Met Metropolitan Opera. You know, I wanted to play tuba with a major symphony or a major opera company. And so I was a split major on tuba and piano, classical piano. And then I also played bass guitar in the jazz band. And then I played six nights a week uh, in a rock and roll band to, and worked my way through school. That way we, back in those days, we could we could work within 50 miles of Lansing, Michigan. We So we never had to stay overnight anywhere. We could always come back, get back at two or three in the morning, but you could still make a 10 or 11 o'clock class the next day. And, and and never have to stay overnight because cl the club scene in Michigan at that time was thriving. That's amazing because you just went you went from all that and from wanting to be in the symphony to and doing jazz and then rock and roll. What made? How did you get into country? What what made you do that complete turnaround? It Nashville was closer than Los Angeles. <laughs> that's that's. <laughs> That's it. You, you, I don't. I wish I could give you a better answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. I just wonder because when I read that in your bio, I said, "Well, what the hell did you end up in Nashville?" So <laughs> it's funny. The first job I had in Nashville was playing piano for Mickey Gilly. The first until was. Um, as a pianist for Mickey Gilly, and there were 10 other guys on the job, and I got it on the audition, but I, I got it. But when in Michigan, when I was transitioning out of there, the club scene was being overrun by the urban cowboy movement. And I remember thinking, because we all of a sudden, the clubs were going country because of the urban cowboy movie. And I remember thinking, that Gilly guy, man, he's really costing everybody a lot of work. <laughs> and I moved to Nashville and I work with Gil, that Gilly guy, you know, but he was a great, he, he was a great first boss and a great first exposure to the whole national, the national uh, touring act scene for me. Yeah. What, what do you think you took away from work? What was the biggest, uh, you know, thing that you took away from working with him like that? Cause you were, that was, a long time ago, right? It was. It was 80, 84 to eighty seven. It was my first, my first touring, first major road job. Um, first of all, Gilly is just an um, an absolute gentleman, kind, generous, uh, very, very gracious, um, incredible performer. You talk about Jerry Lee. They they grew up together. They were cousins, and they competed against each other. So one of the things I took away was Gilly was very much a teacher. He showed me how to play that boogie piano, and he said, hey, Mark, try this and this and this and this. Um, and I just li listened to his style, and I, I, I absorbed it. Um, it's, uh, he, I had, he had me doing his arranging for orchestra also. And uh, he recorded one of my songs, had me in the studio. I played on one of his number one records, played piano on one of his tracks. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Jerry Lee. They were cousins, you know, and they fought. I didn't know that. I didn't they, know that. They fought all the time, Tamara. They, they <laughs> were 
So Jerry Lee comes to Houston. To, they were going to do a duet record for CBS. Gilly and Jerry Lee were going to do a cousin's record or something. So I missed the first day of recording, and I thought, I, I said to myself, I'm going to the studio for day number two. I need to see the killer live on the, and on the piano and see what he does. <laughs> I showed up, and Gilly comes up. He said, Mark. Jerry Lee and I had a massive blowout last night. He He's not coming back to the studio. We still have to finish this record. So you go in and play piano. So I ended up playing on eight of the tracks on that record with, <laughs> with, with Jerry Lee's band, James Burton and those guys. It was just, you know, Gilly was a lot of, it was, I learned a lot. And you know what, Tamara, let me tell you, one of the main things I learned, Mickey Gilly always said, make, the promoters have to make money. So he would take a massive cut. If, if a promoter was losing money at a concert because there wasn't quite enough ticket sales, Gilly would cut his price so that com promoter would live to see another day, you know? And, and that's what I think is missing in the industry today, you know? But he, he absolutely was all about the promoters. They are the lifeblood of the industry. Yeah, well, that's good. That, that was good advice, actually. So, yeah, I can see that because you've got to keep them happy. You know, you do. You really do. But um, I know I, I just can't believe that they were uh, that that Jerry Lee Lewis and the hit were cousins. That just amazes me. I had no idea. You know, and Jimmy uh, Swaggart, the, the preacher. And Jimmy they were all cousins. Oh, yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> oh my God. God, I can't believe I just can't believe it. See, I would have loved to have I don't know how old I would have been then, but my I would I was just a kid when I saw those records at my mother's it was at her parents' house. And so um, you know, I just remember she let me keep that little forty five and I play I fell in love with that Great Balls of Fire. I just thought that was the greatest song in the world. So <laughs> That's cool. but, uh, hey, hey, Tamara, I have a yeah. question. Am okay. I, am I talking too loud? No, no. Okay, okay. No, you're okay. good. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, thumbs up. Okay, this is something I want to ask because, and you, I think I know the answer because you sort of gave it, but I, I, and when I interview a lot of musicians, I'm always curious because some of the people I've interviewed, their parents, and even artists, who paint or sculptors, anything, uh, their parents have sort of, uh, most of them say they're eventually very supportive, but a lot of them, parent, their parents would try to steer them away because they were like, oh my God, don't you can't make a living doing that. You know, were your pa are parents uh, always supportive or did they, were they leery of you wanting to be in the music industry? No, they, they, um, I mean, when I was younger, I want, you know, at, at some of these, I went to some of these music camps and, and they saw that I started getting scholarships and stuff. And so they saw that I had an affinity for it. No, they were incredibly supportive. They, they were my, they were my bedrock. They were absolutely, totally supportive. My dad, I was going to originally go to Michigan State to be a doctor. I was going to, I was originally enrolled in pre-med and that's like, what am I doing? You know, I just need to follow music. And, but I, dad was still, my dad who's passed on, he passed in 2000. We joke. I said, dad, there's still time for me to become a dentist, you know? <laughs> oh God. So that sounds like you're happy that you made that, that change, that choice to be in the music industry though. Well, it's a tough business, Tamara, yeah. as you know. It's, a, it's, it's, you know, you have to stay moving. You have to, and I say hustle, I, I don't mean that in the bad connotation. It's, you have got to, it's, it's, you have got to have X amount of talent, of course, but you've got to have marketing skills and hustle and, and you can never take no for an answer. That's the thing. Always believe in yourself, always persist, and don't listen to anybody else's opinions. It, when it comes down to it, really, you have to believe in yourself continuously, even, right. through, even through the dark periods. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that's why most people don't see their dreams because they give up right before they, you know, get successful or get that lucky break, you know. Right. 
So I think that's true. But how? What was your real serious first step? Because I, I think that's people's biggest problem is getting the courage to take that first step uh, to turn a passion they have into a career. Well, I mean, the first step is to define define what your passion is. I mean, you have to have an absolute write it down. I'm a believer in notebooks. I'm a believer in and and you know committing to memory and and uh, notebooks i mean to me a notebook define what your passion is and define a plan of attack and start creating motion and start doing the work that it takes and studying you know you have to know your craft inside and out i mean you have to know every everything you can about your craft and that you have to know how it's marketed and you have to know what the competition level is. And that's, that's the first step. Right. Yeah. And I like that you said writing it down because I've, I've read a lot of books and been to a lot of seminars on just, um, you know, how to create success. And they all say there's something about that actual writing down from the, the, pencil to paper or whatever the pen to paper that transmits and it, it solidifies it uh, uh, what you want to do I don't know if I'm explaining does, that well yeah, I, mean, look, I mean this is this is like this is this is the last that's the last couple of weeks you know wow so, yeah I mean I just yeah. keep keep writing yeah yeah well, that's good. I'm I'm excited to hear that you do that. That's really that's really great. Well, what um what would you say? Like, how has the music industry? You you said it's. Do you think it's become harder today as far as um, country music or or in, actually in any genre? To be honest, or it or is it, it is there some ways it's gotten easier due to the internet? I don't know what. Well, it's a it's a great question. Has it gotten harder? It depends what you're trying to do. It depends yeah. what your goals are. I mean, for the person that wants to come to Nashville and get a deal and make it big, and that uh, that's really that level of, I mean, you have to have realistic levels of success. Well, define, your, define what success is to you. You know, to me, success is happiness. First of all, that's success. Excuse me. But is it harder it's it's extremely difficult to get record and you've got a major label that is your bank and oversees theoretically everything you you know all of your work and is always on board of everything you do and helps push you right up the into the terrestrial radio and right to the top of the charts that's that's a that's very very difficult now the internet has been incredible in a lot in a lot of ways. The exposing of music and and the exposing of artists that are amazing to the world that's that's beautiful. Um, of course, the songwriters will tell you that it's hurt our business as a songwriters, which it has. But you know the record labels downloading their downloads are through the roofs so they're still the record labels are still making bank i mean yeah. that's the that's which is why one of the reasons you know um one of the reasons i started this show the music of nashville a magical journey which the, the our corporate company is the music of nashville the first show is called the magical journey we wanted to my partner bob walker and myself and and my wife candace we wanted to create an absolute sanctuary for these incredible singers and performers and our team that, you know, that is run totally pro artist and pro growth. You know, we, we're in this thing, pro family, pro artists. We are, we are in this, in this show together and, we're going to, we are, we will grow it, but it's, it's a, it's like a safe haven. You know, you're not going to, I've seen so much, you just see so many bad, all you see all the music business, bad things you hear about. Yeah. It's out there, 
but we 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 are doing things in in the right positive way positive growth uh, business uh, to grow the business the right way so th that all that being said um again getting back to your question of if it's harder or easier it again what are your goals as an artist that's the first thing you have to define is your are your goals to play regionally to i mean it should be you should be growing from your region outward. That's the way I always looked at it as a producer for an artist. You're not going to come in and, and you're not going to hook the record deal unless you have, I look at, you have to have 500 people, industry people that are absolutely on fire for you before it all converges and, and the deal gets signed. And then you, you have to build believers. You have to build believers first. So, um, did that answer your question, Con? Yeah, it does. Actually, it does. I like that, build believers. That is a good way to look at it. You do. You do. Um, so yeah, it does. Because I know, I know that social media has given us the opportunity to to get exposure with people all around the world. Yet I also know that I've had a lot of musicians tell me it's harder for them in ways because back in the day when they made their money through albums and stuff nowadays because everything's downloadable, you have to actually tour, I guess, to, to really make the money. That's what that's right. what I've been told. Right. That well, it is. It's touring. You have to get out of the paradigm of just record sales driving something, but the streaming, the whole key is then that brings it back around to writing your own material and creating your own material. I mean, the beautiful thing is, I mean, I'm in my home studio. I, I work in multiple studios around Nashville for bigger projects, but I do so much work right here. I can create tracks and, and, and original music right here where I'm talking to you. And I mean, it could go live. I could create a track this afternoon and go, stream it start streaming it tonight but that being said it forces musicians to think you have to think about business it's it's um you have to you know you be part of a team that's the thing because a record label is part of that's a team you know but it's, it's so it forces it forces a musician to think out of the box which you have to do you have to do that to compete nowadays right yeah you do I think you do. And I think there's too many people that have trouble doing that. I don't know why they want to um, too much follow tradition maybe, but I, I, I'm a big believer in thinking outside the box because you've got to do have that little edge, I think, to, to, I don't know, to stand out, do something different. You, you know? do, and Tamara, and touring is the thing. I mean, yeah. I, that's what I can – I came off the road. I quit the road three years ago. I left Lori and um, I just, I just cause I needed to focus on this show and I needed to focus on my totally on, on my business in Nashville as a producer, as a writer, as a, as a, as a live show producer, as an arranger, as a keyboard player uh, on my projects or other people's projects as a, as a husband, as a friend. I mean, I just, you know, when, but it still comes back to playing live. That's why we get, get into music. That's the only yeah. reason I got into music because I wanted to play live. And so yeah. it does come down to that. But if you do it right and you tour correctly and you play live correctly, it's a beautiful thing. If you're with the people that you really, really dig and there's a great synergy there, you're creating music live that people will, will never forget and they'll have a blast. And that's the whole key to this thing. So, and that drives your merchandise sales. And that, that drives, yes, you got to get out of the house. Yeah. You, know, you have to get out of the house if you're going to make some money in this business. <laughs> That's true. Well, why did you have a chance to talk about, because you, uh, the OMG Nashville, because I know you, it says you're full service. So I wanted you to talk about, in case there's people watching, what exactly that, that are interested in getting in the business maybe, or what, what exactly do you do to help someone get started in the business? Like walk through the steps of how you're, how you help an artist or how your company helps the artist. Sure. 
um, I had this discussion yesterday with a with a new client, and um, the whole it's it's all obviously the business is built on having great songs. A great song is the thing that drives this whole this whole machinery, right? Uh -huh. um, it makes you want to go see a band or an a singer. Uh, it makes you the it's about the song or the music. So. Uh, what I what I tell and I work with a lot of younger artists and I have I've gotten I've several people I've worked with several younger artists who have um, uh, Anyway, that's the bulk of my work So the whole thing is about creating a fresh sound and creating incredible music that people will go I mean, and we don't care if everybody loves it. I, you know what? It's better off if people, if there's a percentage of people that go, I really don't like that because, you know what? You're going to have a percentage of, for that small percentage of people that don't like your music, you're going to have a large people, a large percentage that do, and that's what you're, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to build your audience. So it's all about having great songs, right, and recorded properly. So right. I'll take, I'll take singers. Say, for instance, if, if you're a country singer, um, you know, as a writer myself, I'll bring them to my place, my student, my home studio first, and we'll work on original songs. I bring in, I'll handpick a couple different other writers. I have go-to hit songwriters and Grammy winners that, are, that I bring in uh, along with myself. Usually we'll write in a two-man team, maybe three three-man team, but to create fresh material for them. But that being said, I built my production company on outside songs. And I went and started in 1990. Like I said, I started calling every publisher and songwriter I knew getting their best material. And I built, I've kept that up through 30 years, you know? And so I have, I've gotten in over probably 10 to 15,000 outside songs. Um, from the best writers in Nashville. So I've got this huge deep stockpile that I also supply to my artists that I work with that. So they have a, they have a, 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 a plate full of incredible songs to, to pick from, you know, I try to create a, an environment that they would have at Warner brothers. If you were on universal or something, they would have an A and R team for giving you a batch of outside songs to pick from. Well, I do that on an independent level. And then we also write per the project. And of course, if you're talking pop or rock and roll, it's more of a specific writing situation where, where we're not looking really for that many outside songs. It's we're going to write everything in house because we want to create a real, real sound. That's the first step in every, with every artist I deal with because once you've got great tracks, that's going to lead to everything else. Promotion-wise, marketing-wise, you have to have great music, first of all. Right, right. So they come to you, and you've already got the songs, and then kind of go from there. And then do they – you do the video, all the production in the that for them, or – yeah, I mean, I produce the record. I produce yeah. the record, and I mean, again, just to reiterate, I provide I provide them lots of outside songs, not that I've written, but that I've written gotten from other great writers. Yeah. But we still, I want them, I want them to be involved as a writer. On if they if they're if they're so inclined, I tell okay. them it's just it's just fantastic to have your fingerprints on your project as a writer. So you can sprinkle in a mix of outside songs in your own material. And then I, I put the session together. I, I hire the studio and the players. I do all the keyboard work. And we, we go into a, multiple different studios, whatever studio I think would be the good fit for the project. And we cut the tracks. And then once that project is done, that's when the hard work starts, Tamara. That's, yeah. that's when you have to decide, okay, now do I need – you know, an EPK, uh, do I need EPK video? Do I need like a introductory video video combination with, of, um, you know, sp like back backstory with sprinkling of your music? Do you want full music video? I mean, you have to, you have to make it easy for people to get to your music and to hear it. And so, so there's video assets. That's why I got into video. I got into it about five years ago, got my first camera and started learning how to edit and 
light. And of course I have an outside team that I bring in too, to help. Um, because it's so important visually to get your message, to get your music out on that platform, YouTube, you know, whether it's YouTube or Vimeo or, you know, you, you, you host your stuff on Reverb Nation or SoundCloud or wherever it's, wherever it's hosted, the visual aspect and the backstory, people need to hear your backstory. That's so important when, when you're trying to break as an artist, you know, right. so well, so can any artist come to you? Do they have to meet some kind of criteria before you'll work with them, or how does that work? I just I want to hear them. I I I like to work with good singers. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'd like you to yeah. be a freaking killer singer. Okay, uh, <laughs> I said freaking. Uh, I said freaking. Yeah. Uh, no, it's just you know. Yeah, you know. I I want to hear. I t like I told the the my client yesterday just send me a guitar vocal that's all i need to hear i, I don't i don't need to hear production or any like i i don't care if you sit in the kitchen and and record it on your phone just i need to hear what you sound like and how you sing and then i just kind of make the decision from that if i can you know if i can do something yeah so. i would think that would be the hard part of like if you've got someone maybe they got talent but they just don't have enough. How do you let someone down easy, so to speak, or ha without deflating their entire dream? Or I, I don't know. I, I would think that's very hard. I don't. Hard I don't to. ever try. I don't. I don't deflate anybody. I mean, okay. because everybody's levels are different. You know, I always thought as when I started my production projects. Um, I would work with singers who were less than stellar, shall we say, because I always thought if I can make a really good sound and record on this singer, the way they sing, just think what I could do with somebody who is absolutely outstanding. And so that's always been my, that's always been my, um, you know, my, my, my approach to any project. If, if somebody's serious about doing a record, making a record, I'll give them every last ounce of blood, sweat, and tear and, and to, to make it sound as an absolutely commercial and airtight as, and terrific as possible. So, I, and there's no letting anybody down. It's a hard road. I mean, you got to, <laughs> I mean, once the record is done, you have to work the record. I mean, right. you, you almost have to put yourself in the place of, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm the record label. I'm talking to the artist, okay? Say, say John Doe. John Doe has to stay back like a, and start making calls and start, you know, depend again, this Tamara, it all depends what your, you know, what are your goals, written goals? What are, what's your what's your what's your plan of attack? A regional artist? I mean, there's so many ways to approach it. You know, you want to build your following from your region outward. That's the way I always looked at it. You know, yeah. wherever you're located. You right. come to That's Nashville. Anyway, go ahead. No, but Nashville and Nashville, see, I just assumed it was still all country, but I was thinking someone had mentioned that, you know, it's, it's not. I mean, it's predominantly, but are there, is it different? I mean, it's got to be a little different. Well, Nashville's in the best music city in the world. I mean, that's why it's called Music City. I mean, no, country is one of the big, it's the big freaking export. But my God, there's pop coming out of here that's that's as good as anywhere. There's rock and roll. We've got the best creatives in the world. New York, LA, they in Chicago, and you know, you pick a city, Kansas City, there's creatives everywhere that are brilliant. But per capita, jammed into 50 square miles or, th or 30 square miles, Nashville has got it hands down. I mean, our players are just, they're, they're just gifted. I mean, I get a chance to work with the best in the world. And, and it's, it's an honor. And it's an honor to be friends and peers with these, with these folks and learn, you know, bring them in. I bring, I bring the best players into recording sessions because – all of that knowledge they have and bring to the table from playing on multiple hit records, 
I want that on our project. I want to use every bit, but we have to move quickly. We cut, we, we record fast, you know, but you, you use guys and gals that are just absolute aces and, and, and you have access to all of their knowledge. And I love it. No, we, and we've got, and not just music. I mean, our art, our creative, our graphics, our video are, we've got, I mean, I'm still learning. I'm learning. I'm, I'm paddling like, like on full speed to learn, you know, the editing and the, there's so much to editing video alone uh, just by itself. I mean, there's so many incredible creatives in this town. It's, it's beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, yeah. uh, we've got the best creatives in the world right here. Uh, I think that's, well, no, I want to, I'm going to come there. I've got to come and visit. Yeah, that dude. Do. I think I'd love it. I'd love it. You yeah. would. But, um, but in your business, what would you say? And I don't know how you can answer this because if somebody asked me this, I don't know how I'd answer it. But what would you say is your favorite part about, because you do a lot of different things. Like, is it the writing, the production? What, what is, what would you say is the, your most favorite thing that you do? Well, I, I, it's all, I love it all, Tamara. I mean, I know that's not, I'm not trying to cop out on that answer. For instance, um, I went to a meeting today with, uh, for Operation Stand Down, the, our military, and if I went to a breakfast, and I'm, this show, the new, our new production show, we, we are, they're talking, uh, we've got some serious military people behind us wanting to bring us into the USO and, and to get us in front of our troops because we've got the perfect fit for it. Right now I'm on the phone with you. I've been working with Keith Burns from Trick Pony. Uh, Keith and I have uh, Keith and I have, have written several new songs that I've demoed. Um, I'm going down to – I'm in part of a, – a, a dreamers in the round show that Keith puts on again from Tri the founder of trick pony and Keith was up for a Grammy award and he's one of the finest writers in this town. And we just click, he comes to my studio when we write and we write fast and it's all in the songs are a, a level tunes. And I just, I create them. I, I produce them here. They're, they're called work tracks, but I go from there. I'm playing with Glenn Campbell's uh, music director on, tomorrow night at the, a venue in Nashville. It's a tribute to Glenn Campbell. So I oh, love, right. I love playing. I mean, I want to, I love to play. I'm on, uh -huh. a, I've got them on sessions, you know, I, I'm playing keyboards on other people's sessions. I love to play. I love to write this band, this, our, our new show, the music of Nashville. I produce the, the whole thing and uh, with Bob and, and with my wife, Candace, and we've got a great team. So I'm, I'm the team leader on that. And I love it. I love that. I love working with people. I love working with like-minded people and keeping it, everybody spread their wings, but creating product. It's about, I think it's just really creating a product, whatever that product is. I love doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. But that's good. You might, that's kind of the way I am. I like all the different things I do. I think if I just took, just did one thing all the time, I'd get, I don't know, I have to do these different things, but they all complement each other. Like everything you do is still in the same industry. You know, it's in the same right. thing and they complement me. Yeah, but so I just wondered, some people prefer the alone time in the studio and some, let's say an artist versus being in their exhibit around people. So that's what I was wondering if you, it sounds like you like to be around the people a lot. Well, I'm, I'm by myself in the studio a lot. I'm, yeah. pro, I'm programming <laughs> I'm programming. I'm working. I've got, again, my, you know, I, I work here. Our house is like a, we have a, we live in a production company, essentially our house is, <laughs> I mean, we, we're, we've got product and once, I mean, there's shooting going on, there's, you know, filming going on, there's, the, you know, my studio here I, where where I take care of, you know, I, I, I'm in here a lot. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm by myself a lot, um, but I love it all, Tamara. I mean, that's the thing, you know, um, uh, I get to work with some amazing people and um, so, 
that's did you did I answer that question? Yeah, you did. No, you did. Right? You did. You know, and I'm by myself a lot, so I, and I I'm okay with that. Some people don't get it, I guess, but I do. But then when I do get to be, be around other people, like in the studio photographing, or I'm just in my interviews, you know, it's a nice change of pace. But what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you in this industry? But, well, I mean. The biggest challenge is getting your voice he heard. The big, right. the biggest challenge is getting above the crowd, above um, and keeping up. The biggest challenge is keeping up to the gunslingers and the young guys coming into town that can play like fire. And it's just the competition. It's the, you've got to keep, you've got to stay up with everybody. That's that's the biggest challenge probably. Yeah. Um, but uh, and it can eat you alive. So you have to have a separate. You have to have a nice home, a nice home life that's stress free. And you have to have ways to blow off stress, you know, and whatever. When you get stressed out, I like to play tennis a, a lot or, or go for walks. You know, I've got my wife, Candy. She's amazing. And she's we just have a blast together and she's involved in everything that I do. So it's like. Um, you have to have peace. You have to have a peaceful existence, you know, along with so you can deal with all of the craziness that can come up, as you know, <laughs> as as a, as a creative, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> For sure. No, that's that's good advice, though. But like, when an artist comes to you and and you don't feel like they have the, well, actually, we kind of talked about that, but um, it's what do you? <laughs> It, how do you tell them, I don't know, to, because there is so much competition, when someone's coming to you, do you just tell them, what, what's the best advice you would give them to get that started? Because I imagine that's the biggest fear, of, especially coming into Nashville, where there is so much competition. Um, how do they overcome that fear of, that overwhelming sense sensation. I mean, I just imagine it would be. I'm, I'm not a singer, so I just can't even imagine how you take that, get rid of that overwhelming sensation, right. especially in Nashville, especially. Right. You, you know what? You listen to everybody, and then you don't listen to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, because everybody, everybody who comes down the pike, and I've talked to, you know the list is endless um everybody's got a plan everybody thinks no let me show you what you should do no this is how you need to do this now i'll tell you how, i've got you know it's like my gosh you're gonna you're gonna hear you're gonna hear a hundred different ideas from a hundred different people that you talk to and you're gonna hear their how you should do your you know what you need to you need to find the few people that a level guys and gals, A listers, not B and C and D listers, A listers. You know how we all categorize people, yeah. you know? And and you need to find those few people that are in that A list and listen to them, and then use from them what you can use, or or. But ultimately, you have if 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 by me saying to somebody you're not really that talented, which I would never say because talent is a result of a lot of hard work and if you put the time in you woodshed and you put the time you can create the product you can Pro hard work and sweat in the woodshed over overshadows talent a lot of the time um it's but you have to have your gym shoes on you have to be ready to work hard as hard as you've ever worked um but again, you can listen. You just find a few people that you that you that their their work speaks for themselves, and they're 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 a list people, and you listen to them. That's who right. I would listen to. That's the, that's the key, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the keys. I and and be fearless. Yeah. Be fearless. You can't you can't be afraid to. 
to say, you know, say exactly what you mean. Say exactly what you mean. Be fearless, yeah. and there you go. And yeah. work very and work very hard. Yeah. Did you have a mentor in the beginning, or or that go to person? You know, I always dreamed. I had a mentor. I had a band director in high school, Thad Stender, and he oh. was drove me very, very, very hard. But you know. I mean, I was practicing the tuba, for goodness sake, six hours a day at one point, and plus the piano, another three. So, but he said, you know what, Mark? He said, if from all this practice and all this, you're going to take one thing from this. You're going to take the discipline, you, this hard, this practicing by yourself. You're going to build a certain discipline that nobody will ever take away from you that will cross over into any, in any skill set. And so um, Thad Stender was an incredible influence on me. I had a, a band leader when I was in college. Brian Cole was is his name, and he was the he was our band leader for our that our rock and roll band. He was ten years older than me. If you're listening, Brian, you're still ten years older than me. Um, <laughs> sorry to say, plus I have more hair than you, Brian. Um, <laughs> uh, I love him. You know. He he got us. He kept us working. He kept us working. He he was. We worked. We worked fifty weeks a year, five and six nights a week. And uh, he was a hustler, and he was a uh -huh. great great musician. So those were two real big mentors. You know, as I went through my Nashville experience, I always wished I could find a guy that would you know a, a real real established guy. Other than Mickey Gilly, I mean, he was a good mentor. Yeah. He was terrific. But I wanted to go to work for somebody at the top of a label. And, you know, I wanted to, I, that had a kind of, my thought was I, I want to work for somebody that's got an empire and I want to work as harder than anybody is working for him. I want to be the best employee he has and I want to learn everything I can and then apply it at some, t some time to my own business, you know. But, it, it and I never did find that other than through books. I read uh, books. I read a lot, and I've read a lot over the years. And I think I found my mentorship through books a lot. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I most most of what I do, I read a lot, and that's where I've learned the most. I, I, other than I had a few mentors going to certain seminars and stuff, but yeah, just reading can really, um, I think, help. It helps me to keep away from the naysayers of the world that tell me I can't do something, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I have to soak up the books the, for the positivity, I guess. But What about Tamara? Look at you. Look how creative you are. I look <laughs> at your, your pictures are outstanding, your artwork. Gosh, you're a <laughs> your bodybuilder, right? I mean, oh, yeah. Look at those guns. I don't even have guns <laughs> like that. Look at that. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, that's, you should, you know? Well, I don't really bodybuild anymore. I still work out and, and do the diet. I do cheat on the diet, but, um, I, you know. It, that's, that's what, what it's what, there for, to cheat on. I know, but I do, I do, I do like, I have to because my dreams are so big and I have so much I want to do, I have to stay in shape, so. Amen, amen, amen. I know, so I have to do something, but um, let's see, what, uh, let's see, we've already talked about the advice, so getting started, what would you do, this is something I did want to ask you though, because I'm all about I get frustrated with people who say they're too old to go after their dream. And I always try to encourage through my inspirational writings for people that it's never too late in my, uh, and some, for some people, for some reason, we have to go through a really, really long journey um, to get to that destination. And um, so I was wondering what you would say to someone who's been on the journey a while and they just haven't had that lucky break because I actually talked, um, I've talked to, it might have been Michael Ken that said he talked to someone in Nashville and they were saying it's the age thing is not such a deterrent anymore like it used to be. So what are your, 
what is your advice on that? Or well, let me ask you, do you think the guy that Michael can talk to was an A-lister, a B-lister, a C-lister, or a D-lister? I have no idea. That's what I'm saying. Do you think it was worth listening to his advice? Everybody's going to have that an answer for you, Tamara, for Michael, for which I look forward to meeting Michael, Michael and Gene here next week. Um, you know, here again, I'm going to say, I think the most important thing is define your dream. Write your, what is your dream? You can't just say, oh, I want to just make it, or I want to yeah. just define what that exactly is. You have to define it before you before you can start on a path toward it. It can't be some kind of all-encompassing, oh, you know, I want to make this much money a year, and then, or I want to do this. I'm talking just in the music business or whatever your dream is as a creative, but you got to define it. Define what you're going after. That way you'll you'll your paths will become evident toward that goal. I think that's what most people don't do. Right, right. But has it changed in like in the in the music industry? Like, is it are they still is it harder for someone who's is age the big focus or has it gotten a little bit easier? Like no matter what age, is there more for quality or for talent? Or You know what? So if a guy's 50 and he's got a great voice and he's out there singing and he's playing regionally and it's like all of a sudden I think I'll put a record together and all of a sudden, boom, he goes out and he plays and he's getting gigs and he's working and he's selling CDs, he's selling merch and he's got downloads going and all, and he's, he's got some a line of cool line of merchandise coming up. I'll do this. Maybe I'll make this or that besides my T-shirt and I'll incorporate it. I mean, a guy who controls and makes a living or a girl, gal, an older gal, that to me is success. Versus getting signed to a deal and then having them take a 360 deal where you get to take a piece of every everything you do. I mean, again, you have to define your success. I mean, putting a tour together as a as a Kenny Chesney. I mean, you don't just get from you know guy from Knoxville to Chesney without doing a. 36,000 miles in, in the between all that, you know? Right, right. I mean, so it's just, you've got to, you've got to go one step at a time, but you have to define your steps. I can't, I really can't say that enough for anybody. And no, age is, no, I mean, look, there's no, so what, so if I said, no, you can't do it because you're 50. So yeah. if, if that's going to stop a guy from doing it, because somebody like me or somebody else says that, then they, they didn't have the heart to do it in the first place. Exactly. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You can't let somebody stop you from doing something just because of their opinion. That's right. what I'm getting at. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So that's good. That I think so. But um, there, so the fact that there's, how do you get to that? How, what does make somebody stand out in a place that there that's so saturated with so many uh, artists in Nashville? Like what, what is someone, I, I wouldn't even know what they're out there looking for. Like if I were scouting out a, the next star, you know? Well, I mean, the, the next star, obviously, you want somebody who can sing well. But, it, you know, just, you know, the biggest stars, and I'm not going to mention names because I'm friends with a few of them, but some of these guys can't sing very well, okay? They can't, <laughs> they, they can't, they don't have, you know, they don't have the, I worked with a guy, I worked with Joe Diffie for five years, and Joe's one of the finest singers in the world. And, and I had one of his hits that Keith Burns from Trick Pony and I wrote years ago. And um, but very few people can sing like Joe. And but you don't have to. First of all, you have to have a, a good delivery, a good voice, a good solid something different that sounds different. You know, something that sets you apart. That you got something in your voice um, that's different, that, which is always cool. You know, 
And but really, you have to be able to handle the real estate. You have to be able to handle a 40 foot by 20 foot piece of real estate every night. You have to handle the stage. If you can't handle the stage, if you can't go up there fearlessly and talk to people and perform and and be just like this, like one on almost like you, you treat your audience like you're talking one on one with them. You know, in, in your living room, that's the way I always looked at it. That's got to be embedded. You have to be have that. You have to have that quality of being fearless on stage. Um, those two things, that's what you look for in, in artists. Um, again, like I'll go back to our team, the music of Nashville. You talk about fearless. This, my dear, is a fearless is a fearless cast. I'm trying That's to get the awesome. light out of it. This this cast is fearless. They're warriors and they're veterans and they're amazing. And but you have to have, and then you're just getting started. Okay, so then you have to have music. You have to have the right songs. You have to have. There's so many factors, and then you just have to keep smashing and smashing and smashing and smashing away at it. You have to promote and market and promote and market and promote and people are afraid to promote i mean because they're seen as self promoters but you're not trying to self promote you're trying to promote a product cuz promotion is huge i mean and marketing is huge i always look at myself and i'm going to stop after this paragraph here i always looked at <laughs> my i always looked at myself as okay Oliverius. I'm going to hire Oliverius as a as a PR team. So how would I, as Mark Oliverius, the PR team, market Mark Oliverius, the producer, or Mark Oliverius, the keyboard player, or the writer? And so it's the same way that you try to build a team. You build a team. It's about a team. That's right. every artist has to have a team. Yeah. Well, I keep he hear, hearing people say things have changed in Nashville today, and this is kind of like a two or three questions in one. Like, what do you would you say has been the biggest change that affects artists or that they need to know about? But also, when, from when you started in the beginning versus the way things are now, what are some of the positive versus negative changes that you see? Uh, I, mainly, in, I guess, in, in country music, particularly. Or well, I mean, the positive the. Probably, I mean, the changes are this. It used to be very few. There used to be very few, quote, quote, gatekeepers. In other words, the only way to the top, that whatever the top was, you know, to find the top, the yeah. only way to getting success was thought of as a record deal. You could only get in those record labels if you had a team of believers and, and a team of people that vouched for you. And so connected 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 network network play play perform sell send demos you know get turned down get turned down get ter told no 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 but you got to keep going nowadays it's still like that with the labels but there's more there's more bandwidth with the internet to to be heard so but it's again there's almost too many op there's too many options nowadays you have to focus your back when what do you you know so that's the it's a negative and a positive uh, again even when the record labels and the gatekeepers controlled the flow of radio and the songwriters were making great money and they still you still make good money when you had have a hit song you make great money but it's just there's We've lost we've lost two thirds of the songwriters in Nashville in the last fifteen years. I mean that's yeah, yeah. it's horrific. It's horrific because guys can't make a gals can't make a living as just a songwriter, which brings back to the performing and the live performance and the touring. You know that's that's the lifeblood of this industry. It has been and it's going back to it. So. The negative is, and the positive coming out of the streaming and all of the illegal, you know, the downloading or whatever, it's still, it's a way to reach people. God, I wish, I don't have the answers on that totally. Tim, I know, right? that's like, I know. Like, you got to put a plan of attack together and go with it. That's the key. 
Yeah, I think so. Well, what do you do? You have any idea? Do you have a feeling on what direction you think country music is going in this century? Because you know it's really changed from when when I was listening to a lot of country. It was back in the nineties because I was married then, and I had my husband at that time listened to a lot. That's all he listened to, and so I, I knew, learned a lot about it, and you know listened to it, and it's so different today, and. I know I was having this conversation with um, Michael Ken at our photo shoot the other day because he he's like he likes to bring the old sound back and right. that we a lot of us miss. Is there? Do you think that that sound will come back around, or is it just because it seems to be going to a little pop? Well, yeah. it is come around, and, and there's first of all, never chase a trend. I mean, as an artist, never chase a trend. You know, yeah. um, but, you know, you've got guys like, of course, Stapleton and, and the, the work, you know, um, the, the work that Dave, that Cobb is doing and, and uh, these producers, there's an old, there's, you know, of course, it's an older sound, but it, it still has a modern twist on it. You know, the show Nashville, that's got... It's got nice retro sounding. Every all those tracks are beautiful retro. A lot of them are retro sounding. That, but still have a contemporary, a contemporary lyric and a feel. I don't know how it's gonna go, man. I just you know I love it all. I love good music if it makes me feel good. I mean, I, we were up in, I went up with Pam Tillis and played with her in Oregon, and we opened for Luke Bryan and Dustin Lynch, and we were on the show with Chip Eston, and. I was absolutely blown. I love Dustin Lynch's stuff, man. Live, he was ripping it. And I'll tell you what, Luke Bryan came out and twenty thousand people. It was, it was, it was. I thought it was terrific. I mean, I just, I of course, I love hit. I love all kinds of music, programming and pop. I mean, I love it all. So to try to say where it's going to go, you know, I there's there's room for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. But you got to be true to yourself. You have to be true to yourself as an artist. Right. I agree. I think if you if you've got a sound, uh, to me, this is how I would look at it: is if you've got a talent and a sound more with the old country that you love, you should stick with that passion than trying to sound like everybody else just for the sake of doing that. Right. Because. Because I think passion is something it's hard to fake or hide. And if you don't have a passion for something, I agree with you. Don't follow the trend. Just dare to be different. Dare to be different. Dare to be different and follow your your instincts. Follow your trust, your instincts, you know, and and do what you love. I mean, I always ask my, my, our, my clients that are coming in, I said, send me your three or four favorite, most favorite tracks of music. You know, send me a YouTube video usually that's stylistically where they sit yeah as a singer as an artist okay well now you because you, you were with lori morgan was 18 years i i thought you were still with her it, how did you how did you land that opportunity and what was the greatest part about that well lori was a like a sister to me i mean we were we were we were tight and you know um, I can't say enough about her fellow class, one of the best singers in the world, period. I'll put her up against anybody. Um, I was, I had her back at all points as her band leader. I made sure she could step on that stage at all times and be, and be fearless and not worry about a thing musically. Um, we, uh, I had I got the I was with Joe Diffie at the point it was the mid nineties late night it was like ninety seven or something and our our fiddle player from Joe's band went on to become our band leader at the time and we were on a recording session together and he said that they were looking for a keyboard player and I said I'm in let me know and so I went they I had one rehearsal and we went out and did a couple of big shows and. That was it, you know, and, and I've always loved her music and it was keyboard intensive. There's a lot of keyboards and a lot of intricate, intricate piano and string parts. And it's just I've always loved her stuff. So over the years, she and I just became super close and, and you know, 
and we we'd get in. We'd argue. I always told her what I exactly what I thought, but she. Know, I was. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I I always want. I wanted to come from a because I didn't see. You you get that in Nashville with with people are don't shoot straight with people because they are looking at that, you know, but I always shot straight with her and I just needed to come off the road and do totally do my own thing. Cause I was still producing a lot of projects while I was on the road with her. I'd, I'd produce during the week and I'd be out with her on weekends, but it was, you know, we, it was a great schedule. And then we got into Pam Tillis with the grits and glamour show, which was a totally acoustic show, Lori and Pam on stage together doing just trading hits, hits. And it was incredible. I was a band leader on that show. And um, so it was a, it was a treat playing with both of the, both of them, but I got to give my props to Lori Morgan. She's, she's, she was my home base. You know, I was with her 18 years. That says a lot right there. And wow. we, you know, she was, she was, she, you talk about write songs. A girl could write songs in her sleep. <laughs> she, she's brilliant. She's, she's brilliant. She oh, is. That's, that's great. She is great. I mean, I, I like her, but you flirt with so many greats. It, you, this might be, this is another one of those probably hard questions to answer. What, what's, what's is more gratifying to you working with, when you're working with some of the greats or is it more when you're helping somebody new get started or it's it's both i mean when you when you put this record together and people are going oh my god that's i can't believe how good this sounds and i can't believe how this sounds i can't believe this is and and the you know the reaction from their people and their friends and their their team it's like, that's beautiful. But I also like getting on stage and having the singer look back at me and go, man, that's what I like. <laughs> that. I'll play a couple of riffs. And I mean, I love, I love going live because I, I, pl I love playing live too. So it's, it's, it's both the same, Tamara. It's all in that same bag together. Yeah. Yeah. I would think playing live would be, to me, would be, very fulfilling to, to see the, the reaction of the crowd and, and all that all their participation with the excitement and all but i want you to, i want you to talk a little bit more about your the music of nashville this this show because you know tell the viewers a little bit about this how you know what it's about and how you came up with it what what do you think it'll do for entertainment in the country music industry? And how did you choose, how did you choose these people? Did they have to audition or? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was working, my partner on the show is Bob Walker. Wonderful, hardworking, successful gentleman originally from Chicago. Well, he, he's a, he's in Chicago part time, but he's here in Nashville. He's got a place here in town full time. Um, he and I go back several, a few years on different projects. I, I, I started working with Bob. He reached out to me on a couple of things. We got to know each other and he came to me with, uh, you know, he got the, he, he basically acquired a website, the music of Nashville.com. And he said, I'd like to do something with it. And I said, I had been thinking of a candy. My wife and I have been, we had been talking about putting a Christmas show together at that point before that, that led to this, the logistics of putting a show together to the music of Nashville. I said, I've, I've told Bob, I said, I've got the idea. I've got the show. I think we can, we can create a show based with narration, like the Opry, like the, like you're seeing the Opry. Um, based on some of the biggest songs to come out of this town. And so we auditioned 30 singers. We, we picked our seven and uh, we went into the studio. We, we finding, choosing the songs were, that was incredibly difficult. What songs do you choose for this first record? <laughs> I mean, we, we got 16 songs. And um, so we were in the studio in January and we we shot our first we did our first photo shoot there and started using that media starting to put teasers out and the record wasn't done but we started to get a buzz um around town and um it led to multiple things it led to it led to um 
the start of our, uh, we have an upcoming theater run. Um, I can't really go into details. We have a run in Branson. That's going to be six weeks. At some Sometime in the next two months, we'll be starting that. Um, so the, as we built the record and I have, we have, again, our team is incredible. We have an incredible host and, and MC named Shane, Shane Barmy and Cowboy Shane. He had a record deal back in the nineties. He's a vet veteran of the scene. He's a roper and a writer and a rodeo guy from California. He he's been playing clubs since he was 12 playing his parents club. I mean, he's a pro all the way around and he's our host for, he handles the stage. So you think about it. We start the show with a fiery version of Ghost Riders in the Sky. We've got a great band. Um, I'm a part of, I'm the band music director. We, we have a great five piece band. Shane comes right up the middle and he starts talking about in the back of a Cadillac, Birmingham, Alabama, 1953. Mm -hmm. And we move into Hank Williams. And then we move through Patsy Cline and George Jones and Tammy and Conway and Loretta. And the list goes on, but we move through history, you know? Um, so, but the concept again, Bob and I had the concept, uh, the whole music of Nashville, a magical journey, creating a show that people were going to want to see again and again. And, and they're not going to get tired of because we're going to change it up. Every night's going to be different. And so we found this incredible cast who, uh, you know, we've got uh, Angela Oliver, one of our great singer, Angela Oliver, Deidre Thornell, uh, Missy Zenker, and a Allie Jordan. That's our gals. And then we have Shane Barmy, who I spoke about. We have uh, Derek Aldridge and Ty Williams are incredible guy singers and they handle everything as stylistically we can handle any anything out there and so um the show grew in concept shane was heavily involved in the writing with us and we created this narration and these backstories that are deep deep back backstories on all the songs that we do so it's not like we just bang through song after song we there's there's interaction and, and this it's just a it's it brings the audience the audience gets involved in this thing emotionally along with hearing it so um and now we're right we're 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 breaking on several different fronts right now and that's that's the again it's hard work tamra I, that's yeah. all i do is stay on the phone and go to meetings and and we all stay working you know um so did that okay is that good yeah but, okay yeah, you did. <laughs> You did. That's great. I've, I've enjoyed all the videos I've been sharing. And it sounds like you're, you're what kind of responses have you been getting for this? It sounds like you've been getting really great responses. Everybody loves it. People are blown away. They're blown away by the record. They're blown away by the, the, the cast, how incredible all they, they all are. And they all, they're aces. They're all workers, worker bees, hardworking killers. Our cast is, um, people are blown away. And, and, it's just right now we're at that period where we're just getting it to the stage. Once we get this thing on stage, Katie, bar the door, girl. Yeah. It's going to be wide open. <laughs> Do you, you have I, You mark my words. I'm saying it on Tamara's okay. closet. Good. Get ready, folks. Get All ready. right. Well, have, have, you, have you got any, are you closer to the, when, the, when the tour begins, or is that still – in negotiation well, we're, it's still in negotiation right now we don't have a firm start date but it's going to be late september early okay. october sometime we're going to do a we're going to sit down at a theater uh in branson for six weeks so yeah well i'm, I'm excited about it i think it's going to be awesome and you're going to go all over the place it sounds like well i want to have multiple shows going just yeah. like just like we were a Phantom of the Opera or something, you know, we're going to have multiple shows going. One yeah. in Vegas, one in Branson, and one in, I'm speaking right now, I've got interest in Off-Broadway. Some Off-Broadway producers are talking to me about bringing the show there. So I'd love, oh. to, I'd love to sit down in New York, wouldn't you, for a couple of months and yeah. give it a crack? <laughs> yeah. give the big, take a bite out of that big apple, baby. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> I know that's where you want to go. That's it. That's it. I know. Well, this is 
for in the end i just i had to know your thoughts on this because we lost another great legend and you know he's just touched so many lives over the year um and you know with and you know i was watching an interview with alice cooper talking about glenn campbell and you know I, it was touching to me i didn't know they were such good friends and that he and and I saw something with his wife too. He was very open about his diagnosis and he wanted his wife to speak out about, you know, raising awareness for, for the disease. What, what, what do you think, like, what legacy do you think he's left the mu music industry with today? Cause I, I didn't even realize he was so well respected by rock and roller guitarists. I just didn't realize that. Glenn Campbell was, should be on Mount Rushmore, you know, I mean, that's the legacy he left, okay? Not only, I mean, before he hit as a singer, he was playing on, he was playing the guitar on Beach Boys records and Sinatra's records. He was one of the, he was the top, in the top three or four in Los Angeles as a session guitar player. He, he was an absolute master virtuoso guitar player. Okay, so that right there sets him apart. Then you take that voice, that beautiful, incredible, heartfelt voice. My God, Tamara, by the time <laughs> I get to Phoenix, Wichita Lyman, Galveston, yeah. Limestone Cowboy, I mean, uh, Gentle on My Mind. I mean, I, like I said, I'm playing with his band leader. Jeff Dayton was his music director up until he quit touring. Um, and Jeff, I'm going to do a show with, I'm going to play with Jeff on tomorrow night here in town. And we're going to cover, we're just going to go through and Jeff's going to sing his hits. And I'm, I can't wait. I listen to the stuff as I work it through. I mean, if you can't listen to Wichita Lyman without almost crying, there's something wrong with you. That's the most, that's one of the most beautiful songs ever done. Glenn Campbell's a monster. I, I, there's His music, obviously, it, it stands the test of time. I mean. We all we all pale in comparison to Glenn Campbell, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, what about his career? Like, not just as an artist, but also as a man. Do you think that, like, what forever touched you personally or inspire you on the rest of your journey? Is there? I talked to him one time. We were playing in Branson. I was we were doing a show down the street. He and Andy Williams were doing a show. And I, we had a half hour gap in the show, so we scooted over to his show, and I, you know, got a chance to talk to him backstage. And he was just talking about how he was, how he played uh, uh, guitar on "Help Me, Rhonda," you know, for the Beach Boys. He was, we were talking about how he held the guitar, how he fingered the guitar, or something, you know. And he was just, <laughs> gracious, he was gracious. And then he went out and he opened up with Galveston. And I, that was a first, I only saw like two songs, but before I had to go to do our show, but how he touched me, I mean, his music touched me. I don't know, really, I never knew him really, but yeah. his music and the beauty of his music was exquisite. That touched me and it still does. So that's how he still touches me as a, as a, as a listener. And, you know, um, that's, that's pretty much all I can put in, put in on that, you know? Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to see someone like that go, but he did, ha he had a good life for sure. He yes, he did. He, he really, really did. So it's, he's, he's left, he's left us all something in our hearts. So I think that's, right. he, he did what he came here to do. So that was very, that's very good. Mm -hmm. Always yeah. good. But I hate to end this, Mark. Is there anything that we didn't talk about? I want to thank you again for being here with me. It's been such so much fun, and for me to get a chance to get to know you a little and talk to you. And I'm sorry I didn't get to see Candy, but that's just that's all you know. right. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to add or mention that we didn't cover? No, again, I, I just think, you know, define your dreams, work harder than everybody else around you. Those two things, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that's great advice. I do think that's great advice because I, I learned years ago, it took me a while to understand what it mean, meant, but I heard the speaker say, you have to have clarity on your dream because he said, you can't just say, I want to make a lot of money. He said, well, why do you want to make a lot of money? 
you know, why do you want to do yeah. this? You know, and, it, and then when I got clarity and that's when I started the show almost three years ago. And so, and I did what you do. I wrote down everything I wanted to do, why I wanted to do it and everything. And that's when things started to happen. So I think that's good advice that you give. You, it's, the, it's clarity on, on what it is you want and why you want it, you know. Tamara, you just keep up the good work, young lady. This is great. <laughs> you're doing terrific. You're you're really working hard, and I like everything I'm seeing. And your your artwork, your creative is awesome. Just it's a pleasure being here. Okay. Yeah, don't hang up yet. I'm gonna say okay. bye to viewers. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. So make sure you check out Mark's websites at uh, omgnashville.com and also the music of Nashville.com. And I want to thank the viewers for their continued support. Make sure you share the replay. It'll be in. It's, it'll remain in my YouTube channel, Tamara's Closet. And so share it so you can help me continue to celebrate Mark and his music on Nashville. And um, and it'll also be in my blog, TamarasCloset.com. And I'll have some of his links in there as well. So, but join me in September as I'll also be interviewing uh, a local artist here, Michael Ken. So stay tuned for that. We don't have a date yet. And then I've got some other artists of paint coming, and we're working out on those dates too. So stay tuned to Tamara's Closet uh, so we're, you'll know what's coming up next. And to your own success, just, just keep on rocking it. Thanks.